Thank you. All right. So like we said, we're going to be talking a little bit about our uh, research findings on checkout optimization. So first, let me give you a little background about Baymard. So we are an independent web usability research institute, and we do large scale e-commerce usability research. And over the past 10 years, we've completed over 42,000 hours of research on all aspects of the e-commerce user experience. So that's everything from basic form fields to the entire mobile experience. And today I'm going to present just a subset of our user research findings. Now, when we are doing large scale research, we do client work for top companies like these. And before I dive into our specific checkout optimization recommendations, let me give you a little bit more context about our research methodology and the overall structure of our research foundation. So our research spans across seven key themes, and we again cover every aspect of the e commerce experience. So the entire user flow that a user might encounter. And we use a mix of methodologies that are designed to uncover real user behavior when people are exposed to different design patterns. So we use methods like in-person think aloud usability testing, eye tracking studies, and we also do quantitative studies. Now through our testing, we found that in total users can run into more than 11,000 specific and preventable usability issues. And we've distilled all of these issues into 792 user experience guidelines that show the exact design patterns that we've observed through testing to consistently cause issues for users, as well as the design patterns that consistently solve them. Now we've taken all of those 792 weighted guidelines and then we manually benchmark them across the top 60 grossing e-commerce sites from the United States and Europe across all those guidelines. So this leads to the world's most comprehensive e-commerce UX benchmark database with more than 40,000 UX performance scores and almost 35,000 best and worst practice examples. So this is really powerful for understanding the current state of the e-com industry, the competitive landscape, um, any missed or strategic opportunities for your site, and also providing you with performance verified best practices examples. And all of this is within Baymar Premium on our site, um, which is where all of the recommendations and observations that we talk about today uh, actually come from. So what I want to focus on today is five key findings from testing the world's leading checkout flows. And again, this represents just a small sampling of all the research findings that we've observed in our 10 years of studying both desktop and mobile checkout. So first, let's start with the basics of what causes abandonment or keeps users from successfully completing checkout. So pretty much all e-commerce sites face this challenge, and that's that almost 70% of users who put something in their cart end up abandoning. So if you stop for a moment and think and consider that number, that's you know over two thirds of users. And checkout is always one of my favorite topics to talk about in UX because it's the point at which on some level users have already decided they want to give you their money, right? So we should really be focused on making that as easy as possible. Now, your own number might be slightly higher or lower than this average, but it's still important to look at your own checkout and see what you might be able to do to affect that number, because otherwise you can essentially be leaving money on the table. Now, of course, there are going to be lots of different reasons why users abandon their cart. And what we find from our quantitative studies is that there's a large segment of users who abandon because they're still exploring and they're just not ready to purchase yet. And when it comes to checkout optimization, there's only so much we can do from a usability perspective to control that. So what we really want to pay attention to are those reasons that users abandon during checkout that we do have control over. Oh, sorry. Now, if we look here, we can see that there's actually quite a number of reasons that users abandon that from a UX perspective, there's something that we can do about. So things like the site wanting me to create an account, the checkout process being too long and complicated, or even things like not trusting the site with their credit card information. From a UX perspective, these are all things that we can chip away at in order to help increase that conversion rate. 
So, you know, a 0% card abandonment rate is going to be unattainable, but we can certainly do better than 70%. If we focus exclusively on the checkout usability issues, which, you know, during multiple rounds of large scale usability testing, we've seen can be fixed from design improvements, then the average large scale e commerce site can gain a 35% increase in conversion rate. So from our UX testing, we haven't found that one magic bullet, that one thing that you can fix on your site that's going to solve all of these checkout issues. So, you know, if you're looking for that one simple solution, that killer solution, I'm sorry to disappoint you. But what we have found from our mobile and desktop testing is that there are 134 specific checkout design parameters that can all be tweaked and honed in order to bring that uh, checkout experience to be the most seamless and intuitive possible and help people get all the way through. Now we found that the average large scale e-commerce site has 39 checkout usability issues to address. So that's really 39 potential areas for improvement. That might seem like a daunting project, but don't let these numbers discourage you. Really, once we start looking at it, the vast majority of the checkout changes that we propose are gonna be related to really basic things like page layout, the addition of simple form features, and most of them are not going to require any advanced technical implementation or very deep pockets. So as we go through the rest of our findings, I hope that you begin to see how accessible a lot of these changes really are. So as we saw this too long or too complicated checkout process accounts for 23% of checkout abandonments. So you might be asking yourself then, what is the ideal length for a checkout flow? Well, let's look a little closer at what the average is. So in 2012, the average checkout flow for the largest e-commerce sites was 5.08 steps, and that's including the cart step. Because in the mind of the user, when we talk about checkout length, what we find is they often count the cart step as part of the checkout flow. So as users perceive it that way, at Baymer, we also count it that way. Now, what's also really important here is that when we talk about or define the number of checkout steps, is that if users see a new page or a new view in the checkout flow that contains form fields and a button they click in order to proceed to the next step, users are going to perceive that as its own unique step. And I mention that because there are some design patterns in checkout flows that have kind of an accordion layout or that one page checkout where technically it's implemented as one page, but it has these multiple sections that collapse and expand to reveal these different form fields. Um, so if there are these multiple sections that continually expand and collapse as users make their way through the flow, users are actually going to count that in their mind as separate steps. Okay, so we've got the definitions out of the way. Let's take a look at where we are now. So we're at 4.93 steps in 2019. So there's basically no change over time um, as far as the, the average length of checkout. Now we can break this down a little bit more. Uh, this is how many steps the average e-commerce site has and that dark blue is 2012 and then the light blue is 2019. So we see here on the left that there aren't that many real true one-step checkouts um, and these are actually on the decline. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we're also seeing these very long eight or nine step checkouts disappearing. Now the big evolution here over the past 10 years, even though the average is still very similar, is this tendency for longer checkout flows. So taking that six checkout steps as an example, the number from 2012 to 2019 has actually doubled. Now, when we're looking at these numbers, you might ask yourself, you know, what's going on here? Don't the world's largest e-commerce sites get that it's an issue to have these long and complicated checkout flows? Well, what we found across all of our testing is something that might sound slightly counterintuitive at first, and that's that the number of checkout steps, you know, just focusing on the number of checkout steps, actually has no consistent and direct correlation with the user experience performance and the checkout conversion rate. What's a lot more important is what users have to do at each of these steps and how they're asked to complete those tasks compared to how many steps there actually are. 
So what we see is uh, to have a very direct impact on the UX performance, or you could say in terms of lowering the checkout abandonment rate, is actually the number of form fields that we have in the checkout flow. Because for the user, this actually represents the number of tasks that they have to complete in order to get to the end. So when we talk about checkout length, we really need to be talking about the number of form fields and not actually the number of steps. And here we've plotted the checkout user experience performance going up with the number of form fields across the bottom. And then each of those dots represents one of the 60 largest e-commerce sites in the world and their performance from our UX benchmark. And as you can see, there's a correlation between the number of form fields and the site's checkout UX performance. So again, the real question that we have to ask ourselves is not how many steps you should have in your checkout flow, but how many form fields you should have in your checkout flow. So let's talk a little bit more about that average. Um, you know, if the average site, the average uh, e-commerce site has about 12.71 form fields to get through in order to complete checkout. And what's interesting is that this can be almost halved. This could be just seven form fields. The lowest you can theoretically go is going to be between six and eight um, for a physically shipped product. And it's going to, of course, depend on things like the country, the formatting, the address fields, things like that. But let's take a look at what a typical checkout experience um, does and could look like. So this site has around the current average number of form fields. It's a little higher than the average at 15. And again, your own site might differ a little bit from this, but it's pretty representative for the typical amount of typing that users have to do within a checkout flow. Now, some sites have an even higher number of form fields like this, 45 form fields. Now that's going to be a very intimidating experience for a lot of users. But in our testing, we also see a very different checkout experience. Here's a site that has just eight form fields. So the entire checkout flow for guest users, including the payment fields, is only eight. When you compare that to 15 or that 45, then you can see how much easier this is going to be for users to get through. And again, my point here is that the focus should be less about the number of steps and more about the number of form fields. It's actually going to be a lot more impactful to get down to around seven or eight form fields than discussing whether those fields should be over one or three or more steps. So how can we go about getting from the average of, you know, 14, 15, 16 down to something like eight? In the next uh, phase here, we'll talk about our research findings for all the different form fields in checkout and focus on what the underlying user behavior is when they're moving through the kinds of input types that we typically have in our checkout. So we'll start with a checkout flow that has some 16 form fields, looking something like this. You know, a lot of these you might recognize as pretty standard fields. You know, I'm not gonna list them all out loud because you know, I'm tired just <laughs> looking over the list, let alone actually having to put in all this information. And again, your own fields might vary somewhat, um, but it's typically going to include some of these same form fields. So we'll start at the beginning and see how we can trim down some of these form fields to really optimize the checkout flow. So first, of course, you have the name field. And we have here from an eye tracking study where these red dots indicate where the user is fixated on the screen. And then the size of the dot is how long they've fixated on that exact point. So as the user progresses through the name fields, you know, they start at the first name, they start typing their name, Jessica Newman. And before they go to the next field, they actually realize that that field is just for their first name. So they have to copy and paste their last name, Newman, into the new field. Um, but wait, that's actually the middle name field. So they have to copy and paste it again into the third field, which is actually for their last name. So you can see here that that's quite a bit of friction for something that should actually be quite simple. And we see this happen surprisingly often. Um, and also even for sites that don't ask for a middle name. So we, even when you just have the first and last name fields, we still see a significant uh, proportion of users type their full name into the first name field that they come across. And there's a couple of different reasons for this behavior. Um, first, we see very consistently in our eye tracking studies 
that users generally afford a disproportionate amount of attention towards open form fields. Um, so when they, there are these open text form fields on a page, they really focus intensely on those and they tend to focus a lot less on what else is happening on the page. And then the second thing we see is that users tend to perceive their name as a single entity. So, you know, this user isn't, uh, isn't Jessica, first name, Newman, last name. They're just Jessica Newman, and that's kind of how they perceive themselves. Um, at least that's the kind of the context of, you know, who should I make this package out to? And so when they enter their entire name in the first name field, then they have this um, kind of this general assumption of what you're asking of them. Now, this behavior that we saw on the last page you might not see that reflected in your analytics for validation errors or your error logs because um, like that uh, subject from our testing, a lot of users are going to realize that mistake before they submit the form and get that error message. But you, that doesn't mean that this isn't causing a lot of this needless friction for, again, what should be a pretty simple task. So in our large scale testing, we've seen that simply using a full name field really does a lot to alleviate this friction. You can see here a couple examples where they're just asked for one name field instead of multiple. And this, again, really aligns better with users' expectations or perceptions of their own name as the single entity. And, you know, if we have an average of 12.71 form fields, just combining these two name fields into a single form field is already a 7% reduction in the form fields that users are presented within the entire checkout flow. So, you know, this small tweak isn't going to make or break your checkout flow, but again, it's part of this collective number of improvements to make that can really help to optimize the checkout process. And then finally, this is going to be a much more flexible way to support um, more unique names. Um, things like if you have a middle name that needs to be included, titles, suffixes, prefixes, things like that. So next we'll talk about some of these, what we call um, optional minority fields, because for some users, a minority of users, they're going to be necessary, but for a lot of users, they are really not applicable. And so these are things like the address line to and company fields. Now in testing, we see a surprising amount of issues when users come across the address line to form field. When users reach this, we see a full 30% of users come to a full stop because they're wondering and they're worrying what are the differences between the address line one and the address line two, and is there something I'm supposed to be putting on here? Now, you might think, well, you know, these sites that you, you know, that are seen here, they just don't explain what the, the line two is for. If you just told people what to input, then they wouldn't have this issue, right? We actually see that's not the case. We still see this happening even when sites provide clarifying information about these form fields. So you can label it as apartment suite or other, have placeholder text that explains it a little more than just the address line too. And it helps a little bit, but still the, a lot of users, um, it doesn't really reduce the amount that come to that full stop and really try to understand the differences and they're kind of preemptively thinking about how to avoid error messages. Now, again, these open form fields, um, you know, like we discussed before, they really uh, demand a lot of attention from users as they're going through this form, as we saw in our eye tracking studies. And ultimately, again, this is just um, some additional needless friction and concerns that people are probably going to recover from, but it's something that doesn't need to be there and anything you can do to streamline that process is going to help you optimize your checkout. Now, there is a design pattern that we see in testing that does address this issue, and that is just to collapse that uh, line two into, um, you know, so that it's hidden and it's not there by default. So this is going to make sure that it's there, it's available, it's visible for that minority that needs to enter it, same with the company name. Um, but for the majority of users, because there isn't that empty form field there that's kind of drawing their attention, it's easier for them to gloss over what is actually not applicable to them. So again, this still keeps it accessible um, for the, the small minority that needs it, but the majority of people 
are not going to be sidetracked by an empty form field that they're on some level afraid of leaving blank. And again, the same principle is um, apparent with company name, other minority fields. Um, you know, it makes it a lot easier for users that don't have that information um, to just continue on. Now, these fields should appear where the form field would otherwise have been. So, you know, not taking them out of order. Um, and then they also need to be styled differently from conventional links so that it's really clear what will happen when users click on them. So as we're going through checkout, the next is the postal or zip code fields. And the issue that we see here is that when people are putting in their address, city names are surprisingly prone to misspellings or transposed characters, um, like typing an A instead of an S because they're next to each other on the keyboard. And this is especially problematic on mobile where we see that input errors are a lot more common. Um, we also see issues with these region dropdowns. Um, which can be very long. There's often a lot of choice there. So they can be very tall and complicated. Um, now, the reason why I say this is, you know, kind of needlessly complicated is that um, we essentially don't really need this, this uh, selector because we can auto detect a lot of this information based entirely on the postal or zip code, because of course that's part of the entire point of the postal or zip codes. So the core information that the user needs to enter is really that street and house or apartment number. And then the rest of this can be auto detected from the, the postal code. And in testing, we see that this results in a lot fewer uh, typos or uh, errors from entry. And it also makes it faster to complete the form. And again, when we're talking about the average um, you know, the average uh, length of the checkout process, when we're removing these form fields and kind of tightening up this part of the address field, then this can reduce the amount of typing that people have to do by 40%. So again, all of these little tweaks to these form fields is saving people a lot of effort as they're going through checkout. Now, currently 60% of sites do not do this. They don't auto detect the city and region. Now, um, there are a couple important notes here, again, uh, to, you know, to make sure that it's fully optimized, making sure that there's always a fallback so that, um, you know, if there's, for instance, multiple cities that share a postal code, something like that, having a fallback so that users can correct it is important. And also the autocorrect should occur after the last digit has been typed. Uh, when not when the user moves away or clicks to a new field, um, because we've seen that when the auto detection requires that people leave the field before the suggestions pop up, users are going to wonder why nothing is happening. So it should happen pretty instantaneously. Um, and then lastly, if you happen to hide the fields, as we've seen in this example, um, making sure they expand below the trigger because users are not likely to look back at the top of the form and realize that something has happened up there. So making sure that it all falls down the page so they don't miss anything. So next we'll talk about the billing versus shipping address. You know, this is very common for um, B2C sites to ask for two addresses. Um, and this, again, is another one of those things that can be intimidating for users. Um, you can see here an example from testing where someone has uh, completed their entire shipping address information. They're being asked for their credit card information, which of course is expected. But below that, they basically have to do the address step all over again. Um, so, you know, for most users, who, you know, the B2C site, the billing address and the shipping address are usually going to be the same. So the user is essentially being asked to type the same information that they've already given the site. Now, a lot of times there is a checkbox or a button where you can copy over what you've already pasted. And you know, if the user finds that, that can save them a lot of um, typing. But what we've seen from testing is that users don't necessarily pay attention to that level of detail on the page. And again, they're spending so much focus on the open form fields that it's very common for people to miss those kinds of mechanisms. And so they end up um, you know, possibly retyping everything again 
or they are losing patients at this point and that can lead to abandonment. Now again, for B2C sites, we uh, want the default, we want to default the billing address to equal the shipping address. Um, so in the Macy's example here, having the checkbox selected by default, all those extra form fields get hidden by the user. So that's you know, very similar to the last point where we don't want to pre-fill or disable the fields. We want to hide them because that's reducing the number of form fields that we can see. It makes it less ambiguous what address is used. Um, and then um, also, obviously, we only want to suggest this if you know for your site that the majority of users have those two addresses the same. There are gonna be some sites, um, maybe B2B sites or some other um, situations where uh, most of your orders are going to different addresses versus the billing address. And then in those situations, um, you know, you'd want to keep them a little bit more separate. So again, we want the billing address to equal the shipping address. And from testing, we've seen that users often have kind of an abstract understanding of what billing address means, whereas shipping address is very concrete. You know, that's where the package is going to be delivered. And so that it can be easier for most users to wrap their head around and is why we suggest doing it that way. Now, the next point is account creation, um, because for a lot of sites, this is actually part of the checkout flow. And regardless of whether account creation is optional or required, we see that users have a very high level of perceived friction associated with the act of creating an account if the account is created at the beginning of the checkout flow. Now, when users are in the checkout flow with account creation at the beginning, they actually then associate the contact, payment, and address fields to be caused by the account creation. And so that's why we call it perceived friction because the process of creating an account only actually adds a couple extra fields. Um, you know, the, basically the password field, maybe they have to repeat the password and all that other information, you know, the shipping address, your card information, you need to ask that as part of the checkout flow that actually has nothing to do with account creation. But in the perception of the user, they're associating all of that with the account creation uh, itself. And so again, that can lead to a lot of abandonment. Now, again, there's another design pattern we found that performs a lot better. And we refer to this as delayed account creation. And this actually makes those one or two extra fields actually feel like just the one or two fields they actually are. And it leads to this uh, feeling of less friction with the checkout process. And it looks something like this, where the user starts in checkout, selects guest checkout, they go through the checkout process like they normally would. And then on the receipt or the order confirmation page, we just ask them for their password. And so now that account creation, again, feels as, as quick and simple as it actually is and doesn't make people feel uh, overwhelmed by you know, this kind of weird perceived friction that's happening. Now, again, we have a couple important details. We wanna make sure that we explain that the delayed account creation exists at the beginning of the process because there might be some users who know going into checkout that they want to make an account. We don't want them to uh, you know, try to find you know, leave the checkout process to create an account and come back. And then we also want to explain the benefits of creating an account, you know, whether that's order tracking, loyalty points, whatever is relevant to your site to entice people to take advantage of that. So we started with 16 form fields, and now we're down to just eight that are visible by default. So that's a full 50% reduction in form fields. Um, so, you know, just collapsing some of these um, fields into one, um, having auto detection, um, hiding these optional minority fields, and then the password or possibly the repeat password fields, um, again, if they're optional, added to the end of checkout as part of that delayed account creation. All right, so next let's talk about users' perceptions of security. So a significant proportion of uh, subjects in our testing uh, abandoned a checkout because they were afraid of giving the site their credit card information. Um, and there's actually some user experience design patterns that we can use to alleviate that fear.
because what's interesting is that the actual security of the site is not the same as users perceived sense of security because of course most users don't have the technical insight to recognize or know what makes a page secure. What's important is the user's perception of the security and that's largely determined by this kind of gut feeling like literally do they trust the look and feel of the site. Um, so they're looking for things like those security icons, badges, you know, reassuring microcopy or just this general feeling of robustness. Those are things that make people feel like the site is secure. And parts that don't have these visual cues can inspire less confidence, despite the fact that these fields, you know, being part of the same form are all going to be, um, you know, the same level of secure, essentially. And we see the two major factors that affect a user's perception of the site security are brand. Um, so large brands don't have to do as much work to reinforce that sense of security because they're already on some level trusted. And then visually what the site looks like. So having these visual security cues that can help people um, kind of reinforce that perception of whether or not a site is secure. Now, from a technical perspective, of course, that last point doesn't really make any sense because, you know, if the page is HTTPS, um, you know, all the fields are going to be equally encrypted. So having these cues doesn't actually do anything to make the site more secure. Um, but again, people don't have that level of insight um, and they're likely going to perceive some parts of the checkout page as more secure than others, um, even though, you know, as uh, as Internet professionals, we know that that's not really how it works. So what we can do is leverage this misconception, right? So if users have less confidence in site security, if the credit card fields don't look or feel extra secure, then what we can do is add this visual robustness around them to enhance um, the feeling that they're secure. So again, we're not actually doing anything to physically actually make it more secure. We're just helping people, you know, kind of have that implicit feeling that there's attention being drawn to these fields adding things even like labeling it as secure, adding like padlock symbols, those things can go a long way to helping people trust the site more with their uh, credit card information. Now, again, another visual cue we've seen to be effective is trust badges or, you know, SSL certificates. Um, you know, these visual cues to indicate that a site is trustworthy. And our research indicates that some of these symbols are more recognized and kind of perceived as more trustworthy than others. But the most uh, interesting thing, I think, is that these fake seals, so like generic padlocks or um, you know, secure checkout badges that aren't actually related to a third party actually perform pretty well. And they perform even better than real SSL seals issued by brands like GeoTrust and Komodo. So, you know, this generic seal is trusted more than, you know, real big businesses. And again, that just shows you that users are going by their gut feeling and they don't have a technical level of expertise to fall back on. Now, the last set of insights that I want to share today are about optimizing for mobile keyboards because we find that um, input errors with mobile devices is a lot more common than on desktop due to, you know, the small uh, area that you have to type on mobile. And so this can be a really um, important way to optimize for the checkout input that you're going to need. Now, there are four touch keyboard optimizations that we've encountered in our large scale mobile checkout usability sessions. And we find that 85% of sites get one or more of these touch keyboard optimizations wrong and 60% get two of them wrong. So we'll go through each one um, and you know, discuss it in a little more detail. The first is that we want to disable the autocorrect when the dictionary is weak. So many touch keyboards have this autocorrect feature built in, um, which can be very helpful when you're writing a text, but it's not going to be as helpful when they're in the middle of checkout. And 79% of mobile sites currently don't do this. What we see happening is that correct input gets replaced with incorrect ones. And you might have had this experience. I certainly do with my last name, Tots, of having it autocorrected to something that isn't my name. Now, for 
a user who notices this is just going to be an annoyance because they have to go back and correct the incorrect information before they can move on. But there's a risk that the user won't notice it. And then that can be very harmful because they might not receive their order, you know, if the city or the address or their name was autocorrected without their knowledge. So it's really important to do this for things like name, address, and city, where there's a high risk that the uh, autocorrect is going to be a little overzealous. And we have an example of the, the kind of code that you would need to implement in order to make sure that that happens on your site. Now, number two, we want to make sure that uh, we use all of the touch optimized keyboard layouts. Our usability test sessions show a lot better performance on sites that use these purpose built touch keyboards, especially for fields that require numeric input. And it's really surprising that 54% of mobile sites don't use the most relevant mobile keyboard that is available. The decrease in typos on sites with numeric keyboards leads to fewer validation errors, which results in a much better and more seamless experience for subjects who are on those sites. So in general, there are three HTML attributes that are gonna invoke these different purpose-built keyboards. Um, and we have the name, input mode, and pattern attributes. Those are all going to depend on the field, which one you want to do. So, you know, email and phone have their own purpose-built keyboards that you'll want to invoke. And then other inputs like the credit card number um, can use just the regular number keyboard. We also want to disable the auto capitalization. This is in the 27% of sites don't do. Again, it seems like a very minor thing, but if the first letter of their uh, email address, for example, gets capitalized by default, people want to actually go back and turn it into a lowercase because they're afraid that their email is going to get delivered. So that's something really simple that we can do to keep people moving forward and not taking that pause. And then the last one is to invoke the touch keyboard consistently. Again, this sounds a little odd, but 25% of sites don't do this. So when a user taps into the credit card field, you know, is presented with a numeric keyboard, that's perfect. But when they tap into something like the security code field, which is also a purely numeric field, then the keyboard becomes alpha only. So this results in a lot of confusion. People are kind of questioning like, what am I supposed to put in this? Because it's not what I expected. Um, again, just more needless friction that can easily be avoided. So we actually have a cheat sheet on our site for the code that you can use to make sure that your mobile keyboard um, is popping up you know, in the most optimized way. Um, for all these different form fields, it's gonna make it a lot easier for mobile users specifically to avoid those input errors when they have the right keyboard that they need. So really, this is just the tip of the iceberg that we have in terms of not just our entire research catalog, but even just the research that we have for checkout. You know, the five findings that we've test, we've discussed here from our testing are a good starting point. Um, you know, it's not necessarily going to, um, you know, solve all of your site's problems, let's put it that way, with just solving these uh, five, but it'll give you a place to start. Um, again, the average uh, large-scale e-commerce site has a full 39 usability issues um, to be addressed, and these five are going to take you a little bit of the way, um, but there might still be some things on your site that can be further optimized. Um, we've got all 134 of the e-commerce checkout usability guidelines documented in Baymark Premium at your disposal to start working on these potential checkout improvements. Um, now, some of the issues that are covered by our guidelines are going to be directly related to checkout abandonments. Other only um, amount to small amounts of friction, um, you know, getting frustrated, things like that. But, you know, when we're talking about checkout optimization, all of those little details really count. And, you know, our research shows that the average e-commerce site can improve its conversion rate by 35% just through these design improvements. So all of them are really worth considering. So my name is Catherine Tots again from Baymert Institute. Thank you so much for being with me today. Um, and I believe we've maybe got a couple minutes for questions. Is that right, Dom?